Jesus lived an ascended lifestyle. Paul would later find language for it, and he would call it being seated in heavenly places in Christ. Tragically, it becomes a doctrine, not an experience. It was never meant to be a point of theology. It was supposed to be an invitation to help the journey. The ascended lifestyle, this place of, of, of living aware of Him, living aware of eternity, living aware of heaven itself. This place of abiding is the place of absolute triumph and victory. Hi. Anyone twist their knee today, yesterday, the last couple of days? Twist their knee. You did? Yeah. Stand up. It should be healed. Anybody else? Check, check it out. Check it out really good. I mean, do what you couldn't do. It's good? Tell them it's good. It's good. All right. All right. All right. There's, uh, there's chil children, I think, it's, I think it's several, children that are just prone to ear infections. And they may not be here. You, but you, your children, uh, young kids, prone to ear infections, they get them over and over and over again. And so it's a weakness in their system, you, you would say, or their doctor would say, or whatever. If that's you and you're the parent, stand up. Or if the parents aren't here and the grandparent is, you stand up because we're going to pray and declare. Yeah, quite, quite a few, yeah. This is, uh, this ends tonight, yeah. all right? This ends tonight. Extend a hand towards them, and we just declare in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, this cycle of ear infections ends tonight. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would uh, just recreate that uh, whole the way the ear functions in, in these folks, the, the chemical system, wherever there's the breakdown, we just ask for you to step in and to make it okay. Thank you. We declare this in Jesus' name. Amen? In Jesus. Why don't you declare that with me? In Jesus' name. Do you know what that means? It, it basically means that we're doing what he would do if he were here in the, in the flesh, in his name. We're using, we're using his authority, his name, um, to do something. And um, to, I, I think, I don't know that any of us have the right to say this verse is most important or that verse, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I, I, think, I think maybe the most important verse, let, let me put it, make it personal. The most important verse for me in recent years concerning my faith, my walk with the Lord, is John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, my word abide in you, you ask whatever you want, it'll be done. If you abide in me. Living with the, the felt presence of God is a benefit, the benefit of a believer. It's not, uh, I'm not talking about emotion, it affects emotions. I'm not talking about some you know, emotional buzz or something. I'm talking about the felt realization of God. He is actually tangibly right here. And there's Larry Randolph. Uh, what used to tell us, he said, if God is as big as he says he is, he shouldn't be that hard to find. And that's, that's, I, th I think that's, that's quite wise. So. Um, we often look for, um, well, let me just say this. Living with the realization of the presence of God, we're this far away from living with the realization of eternity. We're this far away of living with the realization of heaven itself. Abiding in Christ is actually a foretaste of, of heaven. He is the person of heaven. There's nothing that exists in heaven that isn't, that is separate from him. There's nothing in that reality, in that realm that is actually separate from him. Ecclesiastes 3 uh, verse 11 says that God ordained us to have eternity in our hearts. There are certain things that are 
like, like our DNA. Our spiritual DNA has eternity is written in our hearts. It is, it is who we are. Living aware of him is the great privilege in life. And the big, uh, the, the big work of the enemy is to do whatever he can through manipulation, through accusation, um, these different tools that he uses to, to make us distracted from what we have a gift to live aware of. I don't know if that made it, if I, I don't think I said that real well, but work with me. We have a, we, it's written into our design to live conscious of him. It's not something you have to work to do. It's something you have to learn not to do. You can, you can worry yourself out of it, but you'll have to work hard. He's the most predominant feature of your life is him. His love for us is the most extreme thing there is. Before there was sin, God had prepared a savior to the son of his would take upon himself everything that you and I deserve so that we would freely inherit all that he deserved. It is so mind boggling, it's easiest to not think about it because it hurts. It, it actually is beyond, it's beyond our ability to wrap our head around the fact that he actually became sin and bore the wrath of the Father in my place so that I, through a faith he gave me, could receive that gift of salvation and literally step into what he deserved. Eternity is written in my heart. And the great, um, the great privilege that we have is this, living aware of him is a continual feast. It's a constant feast. There's, there's no downside. The presence of God doesn't have a shelf life. It doesn't get old, it doesn't become familiar. Christian routine becomes familiar, songs become familiar, expressions become familiar, but there's nothing about the presence that becomes overly familiar. Those who are stuck in ruts have lost sight of the presence and have reduced their life to the routine. So he's got this dream. Chris read out of Ephesians 4 this morning. Great word. And in this verse 11, I think it is, he says, and the, the gifts of Christ, fivefold ministry, have been given until we attain to the unity of faith. So there was something set in motion that he says, this is where we're going, this is where it ends up. There's many verses that describe where we're going and where it ends up. Um, <clears throat> we know that we have all been predestined to be like Christ. There, there is no plan B. There's, there's only Jesus, and his desire for me is to look like Jesus. So we have this, we have this description that these gifts were given until, until we come to unity of faith. We're probably at least a week or two away from that. <laughs> three, let's go three weeks, three weeks. Unity of faith, it's an extraordinary thing. I can't even comprehend what that looks like. 
I mean, I have, enough, I have a hard enough time being united in my own faith <laughs> with, with me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's a lot of folks that could have a church split even if they were the only member. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so he says, this is where we're headed, to the unity of faith. Now, you have to understand, he can pull it off. We can't. Until we attain to the unity of faith, to the me measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. You know, it's just easier to say that stuff's supposed to happen in heaven. I, I mentioned a few weeks uh, to you, actually it was a Sunday morning, so. But I mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, uh, most believers have greater faith in the return of Christ than they do in the power of the gospel. And the concept behind that statement is the fact that we know Jesus is coming back and when he does, he'll fix everything. Instead of us believing that the power of the gospel that's been given to us is what fixes everything. Instead of him returning to fix stuff, maybe he's coming to pick up what is fixed. So, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and then he uses this phrase, a mature man, a perfect man. Now, I don't know, this is mind boggling. This is, uh, this is troubling. He actually has put us on a course that says, this is where you're going to end up. You, the people of God. And the world gets a bigger mess, and the church gets more divided, and he still hasn't changed his plan. He still hasn't said, uh, too much work. <laughs> Never mind, I'll just come back and fix it myself. He, he, he just didn't do that. He just didn't do that. I'm fascinated by, well, by everything Jesus did, but a story that stands out to me in this moment is the fact that Jesus, <clears throat> the disciples had come to him saying the crowds, the crowd needs to go home. We have no food. They're starving. Send them away. And Jesus said, you feed them. Which is just a classic moment because you got to imagine the disciples are waiting for him to laugh and hit him on the shoulder and say, just kidding. You know, <laughs> after, after he gives this command, but he doesn't. he doesn't. He doesn't break into laughter. He says, you feed them. And, and they're nervously trying to figure out how in the world can we do that? If we had the food, we, we couldn't do that. And so Jesus, all he does is he, <clears throat> he gives them he gives them something to do. He says, have the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Okay. Anybody have food here? Yeah, there's a kid with lunch. All right. So Jesus could have created up nothing, but he usually creates with something. It's fascinating that he, he easily could have just from nothing, but these miracles that we see in Scripture actually started, he had something to work with. And so in John's Gospel, when he talks about this situation, it said, when he broke the bread, when he gave thanks, he distributed it to the disciples and it, it became more than enough. But when he gave thanks, what did he give thanks for? He gave thanks for not enough. He gave thanks when it was way <laughs> insufficient. See, when you take what isn't enough and you baptize it in thankfulness, it becomes 
supernaturally positioned to be more than enough. It's the power of thanksgiving. It's the power of a thankful heart. An unthankful heart is, is imprisoned by numbers and limitations and restrictions. A thankful heart is positioned to see increase. In John's gospel, it says there were 5,000 men besides women and children. This happened at two different times. This is the multiplying of at least twice that we know of. And it says there were 5,000 men not counting women and children. Where did the loaves and fishes come from? From a child, someone who didn't count. You heard it in the video tonight with the Bethel Global Response where the Ukrainian people are saying, we, we, we thought the world forgot us, we thought even God forgot us. And he said, the world maybe has, but God hasn't forgotten. There's, there's, something, there's something profoundly significant by recognizing the value of an individual. And here Jesus honors a child. I don't know if there were other lunches that were there, it wasn't important. It was the one that was given to him was from a child and Jesus took and he didn't throw it in the air and go, Shazam. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's face it, crowd control. You don't, you don't create a mountain of food in front of a, thousands of hungry people. Instead, what he did is he divided it into 12 baskets and the disciples distributed. How much was in a basket? I don't know, that much? I don't know. But 12 baskets is not enough to feed 5,000 men besides women and children. Can we say 15,000 people? 12 baskets isn't near enough. Unless it multiplies as you're giving it out. So when Jesus said, you feed them, he didn't change his mind when they said, we have no food. He didn't change his mind when they were puzzled by the challenge. He didn't change his mind. All he did was enable them to do simple actions that he would bless and cause food to multiply. In other words, there's a point of obedience. Most miracles are connected to a point of obedience. And we usually wait for something to happen to us when oftentimes we're supposed to take faith and put it into an action. The blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's a cruel assignment for a guy who's blind. You've got to go to another geographical location and wash in a specific pool. But there was something in his makeup that needed, confronting is too strong of a word. It needed to be, there's something that needed to be exercised in him, in his obedience. So many times we see actions, we see blind Bartimaeus take off his beggar's robe. There's a, a profound action. It's what qualified him as a legal beggar in that culture. People would see that garment to know he was legitimately blind and needed help. So when he took that off, extraordinary act of faith. But actions have to take place. I, I, I remember through the years, so often I would, I would have people do something, um, not, uh, you know, if you've got a broken ankle, I wouldn't say stand up here on the stage and jump off to test and see if it's healed. Gabe might, but, but, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't do that unless he told me to. I wouldn't do it out of the principle of faith. P please listen to this carefully. I will not put anybody at risk out of the principle of faith. I at times will have to put myself at risk out of the principle of faith because I'm not getting a breakthrough. But I, can't, I have no right to put you at risk. Let me illustrate it. Is it true 
that the widow gave her last meal to the prophet, and that was the key to her economic breakthrough for the next season. Is it true? R read your Bibles, because it's in there. And it's a really good story. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a principle of faith. She emptied her own resources and gave to the prophet. I'm grieved at how often I hear people in this position use that to tell people that's what they need to do. You never put somebody else at risk. Unless he says so. And the most terrifying thing, I think, for that prophet was for him to bring a word to a widow who was down to her last meal. And he's got to tell her that the key to her breakthrough is you feed me first. Some would automatically think that's arrogance. I think it's the absolute greatest demonstration of humility because that's obeying to a point you make yourself look foolish. I want you to look uh, with me at uh, John chapter three. And I, I've talked about this so many times, I feel a little bit embarrassed doing it again, but I, it just, actually at the end of worship, I felt, like, I felt like I should talk to you about this. And I'll, I'll try to hurry through the parts I've done so many times. <clears throat> So when Jesus told his disciples, you feed them, and they were clueless as to what to do, they knew they didn't have enough. He didn't change the assignment. He just enabled them through simple step-by-step -step instruction, enabled them to do what was actually impossible. When Jesus says to you and to me, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations, you may be like me going, wait a minute. <laughs> all we've got is a kid's lunch. And if we'll listen further, he gives us step-by-step -step yeah, yeah. approach because yeah. he's not changing his plan. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to say, all right, it's a little rough making you like me. I'll tell you what, I'll try to make you like John. <laughs> or Fred, you know, whoever. It doesn't change his plan. He's got, he's got an assignment for you and, and for me. And here's the great thrill for me is that we actually get to live, first of all, we acknowledge in Scripture, Ecclesiastes 3.11, Eternity is already in my heart. It, it is already written in my spiritual DNA. I am a forever person. Yes. To die and to lose this tent, there, it's seamless between this moment and eternity. It's a seamless entrance into that reality because I have eternity in my heart. Wow. And one of the things that happens when you lose somebody that you love and care for, family member, dear friend, when a, a believer dies, I've been with uh, a number of family members and friends, uh, is, is down to a two-year-old child. I've been with them when they've died. And uh, extremely sobering moments. I've been with a number of people when they have gone from this world to the next. And it's, it's, it's such a sobering thing because you, you have this privilege to be with somebody that you care for and walk them right to the edge of eternity and to hand them off, so to speak. I mean, that, that's what you're doing. You're, you're in this moment where there is no other explanation for this moment than they have now been received into their eternal reward. That has to become more real. The more blessed you become in, earthly, in an earthly sense, the more necessary it is to become more aware of eternity. 
people who are being persecuted, it's easy for them to live with a greater awareness of eternity because they've not fixed their hope on immediate blessing or breakthrough. They've fixed their hope on eternity. It's much easier for them to live conscious of eternal reward. But those who go through seasons of great breakthrough, great uh, healing and miracles, uh, provisions, uh, promotions at work, all those things, all those things are supposed to be demonstrations of the heart and nature of the Father, which is supposed to warm our heart for eternity. But when it's not, when it's appreciated on a surface level, it actually hardens us to eternity and makes us more in love with blessing now. And I, I believe that God would bless us beyond what any of us would possibly imagine in an earthly sense. The challenge is to bless a people but not bless them out of their consciousness of eternity. The problem isn't the amount of blessing. The, the problem's you and me. <laughs> the problem is us. And so these moments that I've had through the years, and I'm thankful for every one of them, uh, some so, so painful. But they are all um, gifts. They're gifts because they're absolute reminders. It's like you have something right here. You cannot get away from it. You can pretend it's not there. You can close your eyes. You can hum and sing, you know, plug your ears. You can do whatever you want, but it's right here and it's not going anywhere. And that's the fact that somebody that you care for just stepped into eternity. And you can either savor the moment and enter into a, a, an actual um, a promotion just in your own soul of what feeds you, what strengthens you, what excites you. You can either, you can either become healthier in your, your inner world because of that experience. You can't control it, you can't explain it, but it's there. And it's more real than the nose on my face. It is, this will all vanish. That never goes away. So if it is, if it is in fact the ultimate reality then I owe it to myself and I owe it to anyone under my influence to live more and more conscious of him. But I'm going to push a little farther. Conscious of him, conscious of eternity, conscious of this reality called heaven. I had several moments this morning in worship and tonight uh, where I could just, just in my heart of hearts, I could just catch glimpses of the nations standing before him. It just, it just, it just becomes so real. It becomes, it becomes as real and maybe more real than us together in this room singing of the greatness of God. It just becomes, it becomes predominant. And, and I need that. You need that. So this verse that has uh, defined a huge part of my life in recent years, if you abide in me, that's living in the felt realization of his presence. If you abide in me, my word abides in you. That's, that's the intentional embracing of what he has to say, holding it as a treasure in your soul says, Mary treasured these words in her heart. She treasured. What do you do with the treasure? You, you, don't, you don't take a treasure and leave it on the coffee table. If you've got something, you know, you have a, 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 a vase that is worth, you know, $2 million, you, don't, you just don't stick it out where the two-year-olds play. You know why? Because, because it will get destroyed. And there are things that God has spoken to every person in this room it needs to be marked in your soul because it's your history with God. It's your history. It's these moments where you were just, you know, maybe you just came to Christ and you began to read in the Bible and you, this verse just meant so much to you. 
This is your history. This is your journey. These are milestones along the way that have, that have marked your life. And you, you write down, I, I, I have marks all through my Bible of, of my journey, my history with God, where he spoke to me. I can take you to a place in Weaverville where I was in the woods weeping before the Lord because I was so distraught over things that, that I was experiencing and my ache for more. And, and, and the Lord spoke to me. He spoke to me out of, a, out of a, a Ephesians chapter four. He spoke to me so deeply And out of context. <laughs> but it healed my heart. It, it helped me. It didn't change my situation. It changed me. And what my situation needed was me changed. Sometimes in the journey, you know, we meet him. And we want him to be the great deliverer and healer and fixer of stuff. And he is that and all and more. But there's sometimes he wants to work inside of me first. And in, in that moment, see, it's, my, it's my history, it's my journey. <clears throat> abide in me, my words abide in you. And here's the crazy conclusion to that verse. You'll ask anything you desire. I, I talk about this all the time. I don't want anyone to think I actually understand it. I talk about it kind of because I'm trying to learn to understand it. How is it? See, God, God isn't condoning self-centered Christianity. He's not, he's not condoning this egotistical thing where God is the cosmic bellhop who attends to whatever we wish and desire. Nothing could be further from the truth, nothing. And yet what is true is so strangely close to that that a large part of the church has abandoned it altogether. Four times in three chapters, Jesus says, whatever you ask for will be done. Here's how some of us teach it. When we pray what Jesus tells us to pray, then he'll answer our prayer. Oh, that's true, but it's not what he said. He actually, this, the context is this immersion into a journey where your heart beats consistent with his and he can trust your dream. Something happens in the journey where my, my thoughts, my ambitions, they're not there because he commanded them. They're there because they're the offspring of a relationship. They're the result of a journey. I've seen his heart. I've tasted, I've tasted of his words. I have fed my soul on what he dreams about. And I've got stuff going on inside of me. And I don't know if it's the will of God or not. And Jesus says, just keep my word in you. Live in the, in the atmosphere of presence and I'll trust you. You can pray for anything you want and it'll be done. He's looking for not an individual, but a generation. Can you imagine this? What would it be like? My goodness, just this amount of people in the room on the planet that anything they ask for. When what he's intending is the however many hundreds of millions of believers there are actually in that position to pray and to see things shift because they prayed. That's, that's where you're going. You're, you're headed towards this thing of becoming like Christ. What does that look like? Anything you ask for. <laughs> I don't know about you, there are times in my life where I really don't want him to do that. I, I, I want him just to tell me what to do. I'm, I'm really good, just give me the details. Step one, two, three, and four, and I'll do exactly what you say. And he somehow, for some reason, actually wants, wants to interact with me in the journey to find out what I want. I don't want to want. <laughs> I want to be told what to do. I'm, I'm a real good doer. Doer, you know, I'll do whatever he says. And there are times where he's just, he's just silent. He's not, it's never silent out of punishment. It's not silence out of, you know, it's, it's not giving you the silent treatment. He's silent because he's already spoken. That's true. 
Exactly. All right, I need to I need to wrap this up. We haven't even I quoted scripture though, so it is a legal meeting. But I should probably <laughs> I should probably read read something here. John chapter three. Are you still there? I'm going to take you through part part of this really quick, so I can get to one verse. Actually, two verses. All right. What's what? Well, I have so much time. I do. All right. <laughs> I'm not taking a vote. I'm not taking a vote. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk fast, read fast. <clears throat> you listen fast. <laughs> Agreed? All right. Verse 2. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, stop right there. We know you're a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that you do No one can do these signs that you do. God is with you. The teaching gift in the body of Christ is not looked at as a miracle working gift, but it was for Jesus. The word is to set the stage for the miracle. It doesn't mean every time the Bible is taught there should be signs and wonders, but it does mean there's an occasion for it. And if you're a teacher of the word of God, lean into it because your words create opportunities. Don't be satisfied with the word only. The scripture says the kingdom is not in word, it is in power. Let's read that verse again. It seemed to go over so well. I want to just kind of make sure you see it. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Stop right there. What is the kingdom? It's the invisible reality of God's dominion. It's measured in the visible. But the kingdom itself is unseen. Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, if I cast a demon out of you by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God came upon you. So here's a demonized individual. Jesus ministers to him and, he, and the demons leave. So Jesus then describes, this is why the demons left. Because the dominion of God that is unseen came upon the demonized person and drove the evil spirits out. So now the dominion of God is established in this life instead of the demonic. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the unseen reality of God's dominion. What's the implication? If you're born again, you can see. Wow. Our conversion gave us a gift, a capacity. For most, it goes undeveloped because we get taught that certain things um, aren't for today or whatever, or they're for another culture, maybe a missionary culture or something. But they're actually, it's actually the normal Christian life. Unless you're born again, you cannot see. If you're born again, you can see. What can you see? The unseen. Verse four, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's the natural birth, and the spirit, that's being born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse six, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that's natural birth, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from, where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Are you guys still like breathing and everything? You guys still sucking air and all that stuff? All right. 
So he's just given us two unusual illustrations of conversion and the Christian life. Conversion being born again. The Christian life is the nature of wind. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus, in his classic, so their response said, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? <laughs> That's funny. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. You do not receive our witness. Who is we? We speak what we know. We testify what we have seen. It's not Jesus and the disciples. Scratch that. It's not even Jesus and the angels. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now think about this. Read this verse in that light again. We speak what we know. Jesus only said what he heard his father say. So when he says, we speak, he is saying, the father, me the son, the spirit of God is upon me, enabling me to speak words of authority and power. Father, son, Holy Spirit. We speak what we know. We testify to what we have seen. God has an interesting testi testimony. God has an interesting testimony. Yes. Now look what he says. He, said, he says, we testify, uh, excuse me, we speak what we know, we testify what we have seen, you do not receive our witness. Is it possible that, that Jesus is saying, nobody wants to listen to our story. Nobody wants to hear our testimony. <laughs> this chapter to me is an invitation to everyone who's born again to be restored to the normal Christian life. All right, here's the two verses I actually wanted. Now, all, everything else was hors d'oeuvres. That was the runway. We are now, we're now about to take flight, all right? Verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? All right, just stop right there. Well, I'll read it again in a, in a moment. <clears throat> when the Lord unveils, gives understanding of his kingdom, he starts with what is the easiest for us to understand which specifically is natural, natural things. He starts with things like um, sowing and reaping. You plant corn, you harvest corn. You plant an apple tree, you harvest apples. You sow mercy, you receive Mercy. See, he starts with natural things because it's the easiest for us to grab hold of. And so what he does is he sets natural principle in place wherever the natural world mirrors or reflects concepts of the kingdom of God, that which we can't see. He draws parallels so that we understand the nature of what we can't see. Are you with me? So here in this verse, he says, if I teach you earthly things and you don't believe, if I talk to you about earthly things and you don't get it, you don't connect the dots, how can I talk to you about heavenly things? All right, when did he do that? He did it when he said, you must be born again and the Christian life is like wind. Are you with me? He set the stage for them to grab hold of an understanding of this unseen reality called the dominion of God 
And he was letting them taste of and have glimpses of how that world functioned. Because if we're going to honor the nature of this unseen reality called God's dominion, his kingdom, the reality of his rule, his lordship, if we're going to live under that, it helps us to understand how that world functions. And so in this passage, he says, if I talk to you about earthly things, being born, wind, and you're not connecting the dots, how can I talk to you about heavenly things? What does he mean by that? How can I talk to you about the nature of my world that has no earthly parallel? How can I talk to you about the nature of my world that has no earthly parallel? There's nothing to compare it to. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, you know, um, these illustrations that Jesus gives all through uh, scripture, parables, other things that you and I learn just through life where the Lord will speak to us about something natural. Um, those are all invitations to increase faith. Here, let's read it again so that you can see it. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, so what was his intention of telling them earthly things? It's that they would believe. His intended outcome, as he invited them into this dialogue, into this experience, into this journey, his intended outcome was, come, I want you to step into belief, faith. I want you to come into a greater place of faith. So he invites them, but they miss it. And he says, Man, if you're not getting it, when I'm talking about the simple things, planting corn, harvesting corn, showing mercy, reaping mercy, if you're not making that connection, then I can't talk to you about my world that has no earthly parallel. What's the point? He wants to. He wants to. John 16 is, is, a, is a sobering portion of scripture for me. Jesus actually tells the, the, his disciples and the crowd he's with, I, I forget uh, how many were there, but he tells this group of people, he says, I have so many things to tell you, but you can't bear it now. <laughs> Whenever Jesus speaks, he creates. He, he, let me put it this way. Whenever he speaks, he releases the reality of another world into the atmosphere. We know this is true. In John 6, he said, my words to you are spirit and they are life. Words become presence. So whenever Jesus spoke, words became presence. And so here he says, I have so many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You don't have the weight carrying capacity for what I would release over you if, if I told you all that was in my heart. So that tells me, Number one, there's a responsibility to be able to host him well, but also to have the character, the, 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 the surrender, the willingness to do whatever he says, to live in that place where you can, you can carry increased measures. I think it's all about this, increased measures of his glory. You say, well, he won't share his glory with another. It's true, but you're not another. We are members of his body. So he's, he's working to build us up in strength, in purity, in power, to walk in this, in this dimension of, of Christ-likeness so that he can impart more. So he, he says, I've got so much to say to you, but you can't bear, bear, bear it now. It would, it would crush you. So here he says, if I told you earthly things, you don't get it. How are you going to get it when I talk to you? about reality of my world that's within reach that has no earthly parallel and yet I've called you to broker it into the earth. Wow. I've got one more verse to read. I'll take a few more minutes for it and then uh, we'll, we'll pray. 
verse 13 is the mysterious verse. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, my translation adds this phrase, who is in heaven. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. All right, we'll, we'll look at it more in a moment. We know that Jesus after his crucifixion, rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and was glorified. So resurrection, ascension, glorification. This is before all of that. This is early in the game. This is early in the three and a half years of his ministry time. So this is towards the beginning. And here he's talking to his disciples. Can I say he's revealing one of the absolute keys to his, his life of answers to prayer, of 100% success in ministry to people, in, in uh, bringing deliverance and healing. Everyone he ministered to was healed, even those who weren't thankful. Remember the 10 lepers? Only one returned to give thanks. The failure of nine to display character and to give him honor was not an indictment on Jesus' ministry. People oftentimes will look at the fruit of a ministry and look at somebody who's not walking right and blame the person who ministered to him. If you didn't do it to Jesus, don't do it to your friend. So here Jesus says, early in the game now, no one has ascended to heaven. So he's talking to everybody. He says, nobody's ascended, with one exception. The one who descended. Who is he talking about? Himself. All right, so he's got this thing going. He says, all right, nobody's ascended to heaven. One exception. The one who descended from heaven. Remember, Jesus took, came from heaven, took on flesh, became a man. So he descended. No one has ascended except he who descended. That is the son of man who is in heaven. No one has ascended to heaven. except Jesus who lived an ascended lifestyle. Wow. Now this is very awkward and strange. Paul would later find language for it and he would call it being seated in heavenly places in Christ. Yes. Tragically, it becomes a doctrine, not an experience. It was never meant to be a point of theology it was supposed to be an invitation to help the journey. The ascended lifestyle, this place of, of, of living aware of him, living aware of eternity, living aware of heaven itself. This place of abiding is the place of absolute triumph and victory. Yes. It's the place where the, the little foxes don't have access. Yes. It's, it's living above the snake line. So Jesus here says to Nicodemus, who's already confused. <laughs> which, which makes it so funny. Jesus emphasized that, you know, one of the gifted teachers of Israel is there bewildered at, at the slightest revelation of truth. Jesus says, nobody's ascended to heaven except me. What is he saying? I've been ascending to heaven. That's what he's saying. I descended, but I've also been ascending. <laughs> or brother, you're just creating an opportunity for deception. <laughs> Let 
Maybe we're already deceived. Already deceived into thinking this is all there is. No one has ascended to heaven except he who descended, that is the Son of Man, and in this translation adds this phrase, who is in heaven. Jesus is standing on planet Earth talking to a group of guys. And he's saying, I'm there now. I'm there now. Why do you think he taught them about abiding in him and his words abiding in them? Why do you think he emphasized these seemingly abstract approaches to a relationship with God when in fact they aren't abstract at all? They're the most practical expression there is. It's the illustration. It's basic. It's, it's not like I have to work myself into some kind of you know, frantic place where I imagine heaven. It's not that. It's a relationship with the person where I live conscious of the felt presence of God. And in that journey, I start seeing things from his eyes. My wife was so good at, that, at, at this way of praying. She was so good when we would face a crisis. I remember when uh, uh, Haley, uh, Brian and Jen's oldest daughter, uh, was first born. In fact, it was kind of interesting. I was back at the uh, Sunday morning, back at the back door, and she came. She was very great with child, and uh, just wanting wanting to give birth to their first child. And so I I laid hands on her, and uh, honestly, this only happened once. So don't, if you're pregnant, don't come up to me. <laughs> but she immediately started into labor. Just when I touched her, she started into labor. And come to find out, it was, it was a very urgent situation. She went and gave birth. Uh, Haley was in very, very serious condition. And a whole bunch of us were up at the hospital. Our, our family does things. We're kind of like a cult, really. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a joke, but I know. I know. We didn't do grave sucking or anything in that moment. We... I thought of a way to, oh no, I better not mention somebody would do. Please don't do what I'm about to suggest. It's a joke. I thought we could build a new building by just selling grave sucking straws, but I'm not going to do I was doing so good tonight, too. I was doing so good until I stepped right off the edge of the earth, <laughs> fell into the abyss. I don't know. I don't even know where I was going now. Haley, Haley. Haley thank you. So we, we, have, we have a bunch of us, not a cult, up there uh, praying. A bunch of us together praying. And Benny, Benny's there. And she just... She just separates herself, goes off to the side, which sometimes that's what you need to do to get breakthrough. I'll, I'll do it sometimes when a family will bring a family member. You've got to be really careful because you're, you're, you're dealing with people who really love and really care well. But there are times I can feel the weightiness of family concern is, is, is inhibiting the miracle. And so I, what I've done before, in fact, I, I did it right here, a uh, group of families right here. And I said, well, I want you guys to stay right here and pray with your permission. I would like to take your son, 12 years old, if I recall, right over here and minister to him separately because there's so much pull. I, I can't explain it tonight. I just opened a can of worms. Just leave it there. <clears throat> so Benny separated herself and she just prayed this. She said, Father, what are we doing? And he, he gave her a very clear word. She did that within a very short period of time. Haley had completely turned around. <clears throat> because prayer 
is not supposed to be us begging God to invade a situation. It's supposed to be us joining with the Father, seeing his heart, and making the decrees necessary to bring about his will on earth. Why don't you stand with me? All right. You survived. I don't know how long I talked, but it's obviously been a while since I've talked, so you, uh, you, you can overdose tonight. So. Actually, this is how it used to always be, you know, until we had multiple services, and then, you know, sometimes the Lord just restricts you. I mean, he does. He, he, He puts you in a situation where you have multiple services, which I'm thankful for, thankful that we need them. And you have to finish by a certain time or you create chaos. <laughs> and sometimes being forced to realize that you can do some things quickly is good for us. But I'm so glad tonight wasn't one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I want to do. I want to pray. I don't know how to pray this. I, you know what? I'll be really honest with you. In my pondering this tonight during worship is my heart, I'm, I'm exploring these verses. This, this concept has been very real to me for probably close to 20 years. But I feel like I've just barely scratched the surface and I ache, I ache for what Jesus taught. I ache for what he was talking about the ascended lifestyle the living in that place of fellowship with him again it's not some ecstatic emotional place it's it's literally a part of the journey where he lets you see through his eyes he lets you feel what he feels in his heart and we become so so one with him that he can trust us to ask anything. I don't have an ambition to have my way with God where he does whatever I want him to do. I, that's terrifying. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that. But I am interested in being the fulfillment of his dream. He actually designed it to where I could live in the felt realization of his presence. I could host his word in my soul as the greatest of treasures. And the end result would be, I could speak and things would happen. I'm not looking for some, you know, some self gratification. I, I, I'm, my gratification is his delight over me. His pleasure, his delight. Everything else pales by comparison. Everything. And you're here on a Sunday night because in some measure you ache for this as much as I do. Yeah. We're, we're not here just trying to spend time. We're not, we don't need any more meetings. But we're looking for the reality of Christ, that which he has destined us for to become a felt reality, an actual realized part of our life. And so I wanna pray, I wanna pray for you, uh, maybe as important or more importantly as your own prayer for you. I'm gonna ask you to do this, I'm gonna pray over you, but I'm gonna ask you to do this. I wanna ask, I wanna ask everybody in the room to begin to pray over your own heart but I'm gonna ask you to do it out loud. Uh, not loud, but I want you to be able to hear your own voice. Um, timid prayers get timid answers. Courageous prayers get courageous answers. And I'm gonna ask you to pray with some measure of courage as you, as you ask the Lord, let me see what you see. I, I want to live with the felt realization and presence. Somehow take whatever stood out to you tonight, put it in your own words, and pray it out loud, and then I'm going to pray over you. All right, so go ahead and do that right now. Just begin to pray.
Thank you, God. Thank you. Yeah, keep going. You're doing so good. I, it's really an anointing on your prayers right now. Very powerful. Keep praying. Let me pray over you. Father, um, we are hungry. We're hungry. We're hungry to discover this thing of eternity in our hearts, this DNA that you've given us, that we have written into our code the fact that we are alive forever and we get to spend eternity with you. <clears throat> so I'm asking that you would heighten our awareness of the presence of the Spirit of God. Number one, make us more and more and more aware of the God who is with us. Emmanuel, the God who is with us. The abiding presence of the Spirit of God. The resting presence of the Spirit of God. Heighten that in us. Make everything about us, our physical sentence, senses, our, our intellectual capacity, our emotional perception, everything about us, heighten to your presence. I ask that you would make us more aware now of heaven and the way heaven functions and eternity, that we would live conscious of that. And then I ask this ascended lifestyle, you who ascended and you taught us from this place of perfect fellowship with the Father. Let us know in the days, the weeks, the months, even the years ahead, what it is to live an ascended lifestyle, ascended to the right hand of the Father, all because of Jesus, all because of the blood of Jesus. Let us live conscious and aware of eternity, of your presence, your heart, your mind. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to, uh, before I, I have somebody come up and, and direct ministry time, there are some folks here that uh, suffer with um, uh, migraines. Uh, some of you have had them for 20 years or longer. And the Lord, is, I believe, is healing those tonight. Anybody who has any kind of uh, migraine issue, uh, right, right down here. All right. Anybody else? Put your hand up. Just put it up high. Yeah. Put, put it up high. I, I, want, I want believing believers to gather around them. And pronounce over them, this is what, here's what I want you to say. I want you to lift that thing off their head and I want you to announce to them, this ends tonight. And then pray for the fullness of the Spirit of God upon their bodies, upon their minds. Go ahead and pray, pray right now. We break that curse of the enemy that would steal and distract We declare this an illegal assault of the enemy. Okay, keep praying. Is there anyone in the room with cancer? Put your hand up high if, uh, if you have cancer. Right back over here, there's two over here. I need some folks to gather on these two. Is there any, any others? Way back over here, there's another one. I need some folks. Keep praying if you're praying for the migraines because I, I want this thing to end tonight. Right, I want to end tonight. But we've got some that are able to join these others. Anyone with cancer? Uh, there's a, also an inner ear issue. I know I mentioned ear infections earlier. I'm not convinced that's the problem. There's somebody who has an issue with the inner ear that the Lord is healing. Who is that? Is that right here? You, is there anybody else with that? Way, way back there. Issue with the inner ear. Oh, goodness, we have a whole bunch right back there. All right, there's, okay, right back over here. I think, uh, who, who is it? The inner ear. I think I'm gonna get this right. The problem in the inner, inner ear actually affects your teeth 
way back, uh, way back by the by the mol- the molars. Way back, is that you here? All right, the Lord is healing you, the teeth and the inner ear. There it is, right there. All right, now lay hands on these folks, and we're going to contend for that breakthrough for them right now. Um, there's TMJ that is being healed. Uh, if, if that's you, just uh, grab somebody next to you and grab their hand and put it on your jaw or something. I don't know. But put a hand up high. If you see somebody else with their hand up, just lay hands on them. All right, we declare that release of a miracle over those uh, with the migraines. And uh, go ahead and release them. Start laying hands on some of these others. We, we've got to pray for more. We've got TMJ right down here. Uh, right, right in this out, yeah. Some of you gather around her. Um, yeah, the Lord's healing. He, there's, there's also somebody here. I'm not positive on this, so let me just give it as I, as I can feel it. There's somebody who has a problem in the muscles of your body, specifically on your right side. Who is, who is, is that you back here? Specifically on your right side. There's a muscle issue here. All right. And there's another one here, right here. I, I, I believe the Lord is releasing you right now tonight. Lay hands on them and just declare it's a finished work. It's a finished work of Christ. We declare this in Jesus' name. Right here's another one. It's a, a gentleman with his hand up right here in the aisle. Some of you lay hands on him. That right side of his body, this infirmity ends tonight in Jesus' name. I right, take just a moment longer to pray for them. Okay, we're, we're about to wrap this up and then go to the ministry team or, or however you guys want to do it. Also, is there, is there somebody here, you have some sort of a disease in your bones, in the skeletal system itself, it's, it's some, I can, I can actually, is that over here? Oh, right over here, okay. Oh, there's another one there, all right, all right. Well, lay hands on them and pray. Uh, just command that infirmity, that affliction in the bones to depart now in Jesus' name. All right, get, got about 30 seconds to pray for them. And then we're gonna wrap this up and I'm gonna need all your attention up here. And... Uh, All right, we declare the healing word of Jesus over the bones, the skeletal uh, system, the muscular system, specifically that right side. It must be connected to nerves as well, that muscular thing. Whatever it is, we just declare the wholeness of King Jesus over you in Jesus' name. All right, just give me your attention up here for a moment, if you would. I realize some of the things that we prayed for actually require, need, uh, uh, like uh, maybe an x-ray or doctor's test. But I've also noticed there are times where the Lord will give a tangible sign to somebody. In fact, the Lord's healing bipolar tonight. Bipolar. Sure. Come on. I've watched this for years. The Lord will give, when, when you know that you need an x-ray or blood test, whatever, he will oftentimes give a tangible sign to somebody in advance so they know what God has done. And then they go with confidence and find out that there, there was actually a miracle. I've seen it with this trauma to the head where there's actually a lightness, almost like a weird expression. It's almost minty fresh. It's, <laughs> things are so clear in thought and they weren't 10 minutes earlier. So I want everybody that received prayer for anything tonight, examine yourself right now. And that means trying to do what you couldn't do. You you see, well, there's nothing I couldn't do. Well, in some way, move. Just do something. (laughs) Don't stand and wait for something to happen. Put faith into an activity. And yeah, begin to move that arm around, that, uh, that check that right side of your body. 
Now, everyone who's at least 80% better I want, uh, of anything we prayed for tonight, wave both hands over your head like this, would you? Just put your hands over your head like that, wave. Okay, look, look around the room. We've got a lot of folks, a lot of folks. Lord, we thank you for that. Uh, and, the, and the really cool thing is, is there's a lot of people in the room that don't know they're healed yet. But when you find out tomorrow morning or whatever, tell somebody, would you just tell somebody? All right, why don't we give a shout of thanks and praise to the Lord. Bless the Lord, come on. Yeah, I'm so glad that you uh, watched this video. I do pray that it's a great, great strength and encouragement to you. And I've got a verse that really is my cry for all of us. And it's uh, Psalms 20, it's verse 4. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That's my prayer. That's my prayer is that this would be the season of rich, rich fulfillment. Thanks for joining us.